Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you. Whoever did the whistle in the back, thank you. All right, I can only do the visual. I can't do the actual sound. So uh, welcome. It's uh, 12 o'clock, and so we're going to get started. Uh, we appreciate everyone coming this afternoon. And it's a great pleasure for me to introduce you to Nathan Smith. Nathan is the K-State Global Campus Alumni Fellow for 2019. And he is here today with his wife, Becky, in the back. So Becky. All right, great. So each year, the K-State Alumni Association invites alumni back to campus um, to represent each of the colleges as an alumni fellow. And these individuals, when they come to campus, they share their professional experiences. Nathan is unique in his experience at Kansas State University as he studied and earned his bachelor's degree online. He earned an associate degree from Riverland Community College in Austin, Minnesota and started working in a lab in the food industry. And that's where he realized that he needed to um, earn a bachelor's degree because he found himself in a career that he loved, but he recognized that that degree, that bachelor's degree would make a difference. So he learned about K-State's online uh, bachelor's degree in food science from coworkers, which is great. And he received his bachelor's degree in 2008 and quickly had opportunities for advancement. Nathan currently serves in the role as Senior Innovations Manager at Hormel uh, Food Corporation in Austin, Minnesota. He has had five promotions in the last 10 years two patents for food products and processes, um, and has been involved in the development of over 30 different new products. The newest being the Skippy P&B Bites and the Skippy P&B and Jelly Minis. Anybody tried them in the audience? All right, hands are going up, very good. Uh, as a side note, Nathan was recognized by Newton, which is the National University Technology Network, uh, for the, as a Learner Recognition Award in 2017. And this is a, a group that focuses on acknowledging and recognizing the accomplishments of individuals that have earned their degree through distance education. And for today's presentation, he more recently completed a graduate certificate in design thinking and principles of innovation from Stanford University. Uh, today, Nathan will be sharing with us uh, what is the next big idea and how to use design thinking to introduce new products. And so it's a pleasure for me to introduce you today. And you have that lavalier mic, so you're going to roam, right. the, roam the, the stage. All right, I think it's on. There we go. Great. Thank you. Appreciate it. So how many people know what an innovation manager does? Anybody want to raise their hand? How about you? You want to answer? So it's for simplicity, um, an innovation manager. Is there a little bit of echo on this thing? Is it OK? I'll, I'll just dial it down. Um, an innovation manager creates new products or processes for their company, um, and they really align with uh, consumers, understanding our consumer. And we use a process called design thinking that I was fortunate enough to be taught at Stanford. My company sent me to the D School at Stanford, um, and it's the process behind innovation. And most people think that you got to be a genius to you know, come up with a new idea or, or you, you have a light bulb above your head. And most of the time, it's just collaboration, and it's understanding your consumer and going through this process. So, um, when they taught us this at Stanford, they talked a lot about J. Edwards Deming and the quality control movement. Um, back in the 70s and 80s, this country was, was like, how, is, how is, are the Japanese cars so much better than American cars? And it was really a statistical process control from J. Edwards Deming. He was teaching companies how to, how to manage the quality control upstream so they didn't have problems downstream. So. Um, this is a similar process, and once you understand the process, anybody can innovate. 
I teach this to employees, I teach this to a lot of our interns that come in, and um, I've seen it work, and it's really powerful, and you can apply it to everything from products to processes, you can even use it in your personal life to set a goal of like how to go to the Caribbean for half the cost. So uh, as we go through here, I'll give you plenty of examples. I'll talk about how Skippy PB Bytes was made. I'll show you some new items that are coming out and show you kind of how we do that. So I called it the engine of innovation because it's really the foundation of how innovation works. And if you, have, if you get stuck, you can go back and follow these principles. So here's what it looks like. It's a five-step process, and I'll go through them in detail, but it's empathize with your consumer, define your problem, ideate, prototype, and test. It's not an iterative process where it always goes from one to the other. Sometimes it goes through and you're like, ah, we didn't solve for the right problem, we need to go back. So I'll share some examples of that today and why it's so important to empathize with your consumer. The first step is empathizing. Uh, on the right side, those are all the human emotions. And so the more, the more you can solve for an, someone's need that's connected to an emotion, like on Skippy PB Bytes, we did, um, our target consumer was um, fifth to sixth graders that were coming home after school. It was that time between after school and before sports. These kids' lives are micromanaged. You know, everything is planned. And we had them do journals, and um, there was a lot of scary pictures in there. We asked them how they feel. There was anger. They were apprehensive. They were starving. And we came up with the term hangry to describe the moment where they were hungry and angry. They wanted to pop something quick that would get rid of the hunger so they could move on to their next activity. So. Um, at the time, the Skippy brand manager, um, his daughter was at the school, and he goes, my daughter's not hangry. She's a sweetie. And we showed, we showed him her, uh, you know, her entry, and he, it, it really opened things up. So it's all about going back and interviewing your consumer and finding out what the real problem is and getting to the emotion. As, as a former scientist, so my role before innovation was a product development scientist, so I was the person that made products. Um, this job is more upstream. It's like, what products are we going to make? And um, when I was at Stanford, our project was to make the San Francisco airport um, a, a nicer place for JetBlue customers. And so they, sent, they turned us loose in the airport and they said, you need to stop international travelers and introduce yourself and ask them how they feel, like how their experience has been. And as a former scientist, I'm like, hey, I need an N30. I need statistical significance. I can't just ask like random people. But really the principle is you're getting to um, a directional. You can always validate later on with the higher statistical numbers, but you're getting to a direction. So one thing I'll do on a lot of our brands is I might be in a store and watch somebody shopping a bacon set and she's the consumer target and I might introduce myself, give her a coupon for a time and just say, I noticed you were shopping the bacon set and I noticed you picked up sausage and then you put the bacon down. Why did you do that? So I'm just looking for questions. I'm trying to get to behaviors and understanding. And um, you have to do this to get to that. So if you don't go to your consumer, there's lots of ways to do it. You can stop people, talk to people. You can do focus groups where you bring in your targeted consumer and visit with them. But you have to talk to your consumer. So in the case of a lot of folks in here, it's your students. It's, pers it's also prospective students and it's also non-students. So people that aren't in the educational system, like how do you get them in? So this is good to do, um, it's, it's simple. Why do you do that? It's like being a kid. It's like, so how does that make you feel? So when do you use that? So tell me about why you're hungry and angry. Oh, your mom makes you do this, you know? And you just build on it and you're trying to get information. So who, what, when, where, and why? You want to interview um, current users, so your core consumer, and you want to interview people that aren't your, core, your current consumer. And P&G was there um, with the Tide brand. They talked about how they developed, I'll show you this new product they developed where they kept going back to mom, mother of three. She kept telling the same thing. So they never really got game-changing innovation. It was always like, make it a little cheaper, make it a little stronger, grass stains come out a little quicker. So they couldn't really innovate. They weren't creating additional sales. So then they went out to, at the time, these millennials who weren't using the product. And they said, why don't you use Tide? And, and these young folks were like, Tide is so strong, it ruins my $140 jeans. They've got stitching in the back, and it makes them look used, and I want these jeans to last. And so with that insight, they went back to their core consumer, the mom, and they said, Mom, are there any things that you're not washing with, with uh, Tide? And as a matter of fact, she said, 
you know, I have this black dress. I have, I also have these stitched jeans I paid $150 for that I wear on special occasions. And so they found a new market and they ended up creating this product, Tide Total Care, which I believe was over a billion dollars in sales a couple years ago. And the, the key insight is keeps clothes looking newer, keeps clothes looking new. So it's just, it's just a less aggressive version to get the stink out and the little bit of sweat you might get, but you're not putting massive grass stains and you're, you're not raising a football team in these type of clothes. So um, it's important to interview your non-user, like in the case of Hormel, most people in here are like, what does Hormel sell? Most people are gonna say spam, chili, you know. So with spam, it's only like 9% of the country that consumes spam. Um, so it's a small household penetration, but people love it. The people that are in it love it. So to grow the brand, I have to sell more to them or I have to find out why Gina or Bill or whoever doesn't use spam. Like what's stopping them? Is there a fear of nitrites? Do they not understand how it's made? Do they not eat meat? So you have to get to like why, why your consumer's not in the franchise and you can do that with education as well. So define, um, define's really important and at Stanford where they teach this, they require all of their degree programs to take a D school class, so you've got doctors going through this program, engineers going through the program, um, business people going through the program, and um, I'm gonna utilize an example from the doctorate program because there's a really cool story in the back end of this. Um, they were given the challenge, they said that in Nepal there was an infant mortality problem. There was a challenge, there was babies dying, like a big deal. And the assumption was that Nepal was relying on second-rate incubators, hand-me-downs from Europe. And so if they took that assumption, they would have solved for a completely different problem than what they did. So what they did is they went to Nepal and they interviewed the mothers and it found out they were desperate. They were living in remote areas. They needed to keep the baby warm to increase its survival rates. It's all about keeping the body temperature higher. And most mothers didn't even have the means to get to the hospital. So they went into these areas, there was no electricity, there was spotty heating control, um, transportation wasn't reliable. So that changes things. So if you're solving for an incubator, um, it'd be a totally different thing. You probably wouldn't have solved for the problem. So you have to go there and talk to your consumer. And so we do that from a food perspective as a company. We have a cultural anthropologist, Ta Dr. Tanya Rodriguez, that goes out into consumers' homes. She lived on campus at Michigan State University for a month, getting insights around snacking you know, living in the dorms and things. So you kind of have to become your consumer and really put yourself in that position or ask somebody, you know, somebody that's in that area. So it's really important to define the right problem you're trying to solve. And sometimes this is a step where you get all the way to the end and you find out, you know what, maybe we didn't solve for the right problem because it's not resonating with our consumer. But you can always go back, empathize, get to the, a new problem statement, and then go on to the next step. This one is the one most people are familiar with, ideation. You've probably been to a brainstorming or an ideation. You know, the principle is really simple. You have a problem to solve or a challenge to solve. You're looking for divergent thought. You're looking for people with a lot of different backgrounds, different ways of thinking, and you're trying to collect a massive amount of data or ideas. And it's called the funnel approach. So you're collecting a massive amount of data and then you'll narrow that down later, but you wanna see the, the lay of the land. You wanna see the universe of ideas. And we do that through our innovation in a process called open innovation where we would go to innovate a brand like Justin's and we'd go out to our, our um, partners in industry. Um, we've partnered with uh, Colorado, State Univer yeah, Colorado University in Boulder, actually um, did some ideation for one of our brands, Justin's, they're based in Boulder. And we'll collect this massive amount of ideas from all these different viewpoints and we'll look for similarities. You know, this idea keeps coming up, there was something there or wow, I had no clue that, that people thought of our brand this way. So it's about getting a, a larger view. And you can be the smartest person in the room. You can, you know, some of the people we work with, they're experts in their field and they don't see it all. So it's important to get that divergent thinking. And you wanna do that here too. And it's just like they say, no idea is a dumb idea. And really the birth of the great ideas are, are you and I having a conversation and your idea is okay, mine's okay, but what if we did this? So it's the progeny of those two ideas is usually the good idea. It does work sometimes, like a case of Skippy Bites, a product that I helped create, that was an idea that my colleague and I had. We're like, what if we had a poppable peanut butter? You know, so it's no messy, you don't have to carry the jar around. 
So sometimes that happens where you just get an idea and you test it and it scores really well and you refine it. But most of the time it's, it's by getting everyone's thoughts and getting input and trying to find out. And sometimes you don't know what the options are. You don't know what you don't know. So in the case of these doctors, you know, they went there, then they probably came back and they said, here's the lay of the land. Let's get some engineers together. Let's get some um, culture anthropologists together to make sure we're not offending the culture, make sure that we can engineer something that has a value add that's affordable. And you, you'll see what they did in a minute. And then prototypes. So what was really powerful, um, I don't have a piece of paper here. Can I borrow your piece of paper? Sorry, props are always good. And this is proving my point here. So um, at Stanford School, a lot, of, a lot of the companies are Silicon Valley, you know, like Google's, Facebook's, Apple's of the world. And we had a, uh, the D School was talking about the development of the iPad. So it's developed the way it is through research and they did some really cheap research. So prototyping, it's easier to show than to tell. Right? So they started with a piece of paper and um, they, they put apps on here that were actually post-it notes. So they were organizing them. They put a power button originally over in the corner and they would hand it. They'd hand it, can you grab this? And most people grab it by the corner and they were pushing the power button inadvertently. So instead of spending like millions of dollars in engineering it into the corner, they just said, okay, we're going to put it over here in the cardboard model. Um, and then they also tested size, right? So it's, I think it's about the size of a piece of paper, eight and a half by 11. And that's done purposefully so it fits in a bag so you can utilize assets you already have. So you can do a lot with a piece of paper. Like it's easy in food because what we do is we've got an R&D team and we've got chefs and we can make stuff and we can borrow piece parts from other things and put them together. Um, but in some industries like cars, I mean, they'll take and spend a million dollars to build a full scale prototype. But sometimes all you need is you can test some of your assumptions on some of these ideas of when you narrow, you can say, okay, let's just put this in front of consumers. And we do that through focus groups and we do that through um, employee home use tests. So we'll, we'll send a product home. And then the beautiful thing we do too is we work with, with schools and other industry partners to actually test with real students, with nursing homes, with whoever we can partner with. And I'll share some examples of that. But prototyping is really powerful because it, a picture is worth a thousand words and a prototype can teach you a lot. And then test. So test, there's a lot of different ways to test. You can do it simple. You can pull in your core consumer, your non-user. You can do focus groups. You can send things home. You can do a national survey. Um, we've got an online community that's kind of like a large Facebook group where we, we can engage consumers across the country and we can test ideas with them. So it can be a mom in Boston and a dad in San Francisco and everywhere in between. So we're just trying to get feedback. What we're trying to do is saying, hey, we met with you, we heard what you had to say, this is what we thought the problem was. We brainstormed, we developed a solution, we, sh we show them a prototype, and then we have a conversation. So one thing that stood out to me at Stanford, they said this is not a used car salesman thing. You don't go in there and say, look what I made, only 1995. It's a, here's what I heard you say, and I'm wondering if this solves for your need. Like, what is missing? And it's back to that who, what, when, where, why, how, how can we make this better? Um, and this is an iterative process. So sometimes we have to go back to the drawing board a couple times here to refine, but it's normal to refine, keep refining and tweaking. And a lot of startup entrepreneurial companies will launch a, a product that's 80% of the way there, and then they'll utilize the feedback they get in market from customers and things to make the product even better. So um, you don't have to be perfect, you just have to keep improving. So what did those smart doctors at Stanford do for their project? So they defined what they thought was the right problem, that the mothers do not have the access. They don't have electricity. I mean, what would you do? I mean, that's a tough challenge. How do you keep these babies alive? Well, they did the simple, you probably have these at home, the microwave, the things with rice in it that stay warm for hours. They basically built a version of that for a baby that's waterproof on the outside. It uses low cost materials. And this sucker saved lives. It kept the babies warmer. You could use your body heat to keep it warm. You could lay it out in the sun. You could put it next to a fire and it would retain heat for hours upon hours. And that bought them the time to get the baby to the doctor if they needed to. So these doctors were just trying to graduate like a lot of folks, right? But they ended up starting a nonprofit um, company and the UN came in and bought a bunch of these. And these are actually saving babies today around the world because of 
the fact that they used design thinking, they had empathy, they went there, they defined the right problem, they ideated. And sometimes it's this stupid, simple stuff like, wow, they just use rice and like plastic and it looks like a sleeping bag. But um, sometimes the best innovations are the simplest. Don't overcomplicate things. So at Hormel, we have an innovation playbook. It's kind of fun. It's got games and stuff in it. But it's really the foundation of it is design thinking. And that's what we follow. That's what we teach. We have an annual innovation summit for our innovation managers where we're teaching best in class practices. And here's some examples of products that we've used design thinking on. So with the case of Skippy Bites, we um, worked with IG Holton, the local elementary school. And we worked in Mr. Veldman's class. And we came in. We had snacks with them. We talked to them. We did. Um, we brought in Play-Doh one day to see what shapes kids gravitated towards, and it was like 70% of the shapes were round balls. And the reason was it, there's a lot of play factor. You can roll them, you can toss them, you can. There's kids love the round shape, so that's one reason why we made Skippy Bites round because it's playful and you can pop them and it's fun. Kids were throwing them across the room trying to get in their friend's mouth. Um, and we tested with kids there, and, and those kids fast forward to today, they're seniors and they, at the high school, and they still talk about how they helped create Skippy Bites. So even though I was on the creation team, like they had just as much of a part to play, and it makes me feel good that they helped design that, and it solved the need for them, and it was an IRI pace setter, so 75 plus million in sales in three years. So it was an overall success because we, we did right by our consumer. It all started with the business challenge of getting peanut butter beyond the jar from our CEO at the time. So. How do we get into snacking? How do we get into mess-free peanut butter? The second one up there is one we just launched. It'll probably be at your high V here shortly if it's not there already. And it's, you know, we went after Encrustables. We started with going to the local elementary school band field the day they had Encrustables for lunch. And they had the option of, you know, some kind of gravy thing or Encrustables. Most kids choose the Encrustables. And we sat down at each table and we just asked them, so what do you like about the product? What don't you like? I just thought kids were weird, to be honest with you, that they were eating these things frozen. But there's a reason for that. They eat them frozen because when they defrost, the bread sticks to their fingers and the roof of their mouth. So they're sitting there like a dog going, <laughs> trying to get it off. <laughs> so we knew the bread quality could be improved on. We knew the portion size, so ours is more snackable bite size. Um, and we knew the fun factor. Kids want more fun. They want more flavors and things. And we knew mom wanted the credibility of a peanut butter first brand versus a jelly brand. Like Uncrustables is jelly forward. And so we developed this product line. It's been really successful. And we've launched it out uh, in a lot of different retailers, Walmart, Hy-Vee, Kroger's. Um, and it was all based on the insights. Then we went back to the school and we brought the finished product to the kids and got their, their take. And they gave us more feedback that we could improve on. Like, it, wouldn't it be nice if you had a chocolate one? Or wouldn't it be nice if you had peanut butter bread? Right? So we're still working on this. We've got a whole pipeline of items coming, but we use design thinking on this, work with the local elementary schools. I also work on the Justin's brand. Any Justin's fans in here? It's a fun brand to work on. I know Justin Gold. Um, we just had a really successful launch at Expo West this year with the Nut Butter Nuts. And so Justin's is an organic and natural brand. So them will launch a, a Skippy Bite kind of product. That's a pan product, is a little bit sweeter, is a little bit beyond that, what their brand stands for. So we needed a, a <laughs> snack that really appealed to their love and life for consumer, who's a, a mom with kids at high income, high education, and she's busy and she's looking for good snacks that, that, don't, that aren't full of a lot of stuff. So we created an organic product, it's 100% vegan, and all we did is we coated nuts with Justin's nut butter. So it creates this indulgent and then a crunch in the center and this is a platform where we can take it out. We can do snack mixes. We can do crazy things where we take cashews and cut them with almonds and all sorts of fun stuff. So it was a huge hit at Expo West. And um, we won two Best in Show awards. And it's just an example of how we started with what can we do for our consumer? How do we make her life better? What, how can we stay true to our brand and keep in a clean label and, and introduce something that would resonate? And I think we're on the right track with that brand as well. These are some of the mentalities you want to have with, with design thinking. So show, don't tell, that's the prototyping. Because um, everybody's probably done this where you've been in a meeting and someone whispers in someone's ear and they've got to get the secret to the other room. And what he said over here is completely different than what comes out on the other end. And that's why showing a picture, everybody gets it. It, it doesn't turn into like 10 different ideas like, oh, now I get it. If I told you nut butter nuts, 
half, half the people in here be like, what is that? They might think it's something totally different than what I showed you, which is much easier to understand. Um, focus on human values. So you're trying to get to that emotion, right? So with those kids for Skippy Bites, it was like, how do we solve for this hunger where they're just like throwing stuff in and they want it to taste good and they, they want to just get the satiety relief so they can go on about their lives. So they're stressed. How do we take away that stress and how do we make it permissible for mom to feel good about those products? So there's five grams of protein in Skippy Bites. It's real Skippy peanut butter, but it tastes good to kids. So it's a win-win. So craft clarity, that's all about defining the right problem and being really clear about what you're trying to do, um, the problem you're trying to solve. Embrace experimentation. Um, this is a really great example from um, our Megamex team. They realized a, a potential to understand the, the, Mexican, um, the Mexican consumer, Mexican foods consumer, in, in different parts of the country and understand regionality by partnering with Western Union, where people are sending money back home and they could actually win-win, understand where money was going and understand how that affected the local um, cuisine choices. Like, like what type of salsa do we need for the New York area? Is it different than the Connecticut area because of who lives there? Are they Guatemalan? Are they Mexican? You know, what are the regional influences? So we partnered with Western Union and they, were, they track money. So we were able to say who's, who lives where and where are they sending money back home? And then how do we align that with their preferences so when they go to the store they can buy something that they really want to buy versus what we just put out there because we're guessing. So be mindful of this process. Um, this is groundbreaking. To be able to have a five-step process and it's not just, oh, come up with ideas. It's like, just follow the process. Anybody can do it. Even really analytical people that you wouldn't think are creative, like they're good at this. You know, you can always find ideas. Once you have the process, it, it, everything works so much better. Um, this one's the hardest one. So I always tell people innovation is the art of being comfortable, being uncomfortable. Um, when I was in R&D, I, I knew exactly what city I was going to, you know, from a map perspective. Like, they say, we want to go here, and I'd create it, right? I'd get there. In innovation, I know I'm going west. I don't know I'm going to Denver. That comes later. So I have to be really good about ambiguity and learning as I go. I don't have to have all the answers, but I need to do something. I need brand growth, company growth, solve consumer needs, save someone's life in the case of the doctors. You got to do something. It's hard, but you just got to take one step forward and, and go for it and just have confidence that the output, great things will happen because usually that's how it works if you follow this process. And then radical collaboration. So everything from nursing homes to schools to educational establishments to street vendors. I mean, there's a ton of things you can learn from other people that have a mutual interest in what you're trying to do. Like, what can you learn from farmers around regenerative agriculture to launch a new product line like Applegate did for their regenerative, um, their regenerative meats program they just launched at Expo West. So um, radical collaboration is key. So think about people that maybe aren't even in the food industry or the education industry and like hit them up for how do you think about education? It's like, well, I didn't put much thought into it, but you know, what if you approach it like the way Hormel does or the way Nabisco does, like, and it gives you ideas and it increases your, the breadth of your thinking. So kind of key takeaways and I'll take questions. It's for everybody. It's, you don't have to be a super genius. You don't have to be a food scientist. You just have to be open to ideas, willing to follow a process and try new things. Um, empathize with your consumer, that's the key. Experiment early and often. You're trying to find solutions and it's okay to kill ideas off. Don't be married to any idea because I've had some great ideas that I love and I've tested and the consumers are like, that sucks. And I just walk away, I just put my pride away and say, okay, that's done. Because there's always other things we can solve for and I'd rather be successful because for every good innovation I launch that's been successful, there's always things that failed and you learn from the failure, but it's, it's not pretty. Nobody wants to have that on their resume, right? Failure. Use extreme users to spark new concepts. That's a key. Um, you can use this process for new products, processes, or even to solve personal challenges. Um, our IT department asked me how they could use design thinking to improve the computer user experience and actually start predicting some pain points. And um, the, the manager there did a, what's called ITation and she started engaging with employees and understanding where there might be things to solve for, and it was super successful, and it was computer software related, like completely different than what I do. 
And it's not what most companies do. Most companies make widgets, and they're like, how can we make more widgets, faster widgets, cheaper widgets? Um, if you start with design thinking, you're not, I don't even think about, I think about what our brands stand for and who our consumer is, but I don't think, do we have the asset? Do we, can we make that in the plant today? I think I'm gonna go somewhere where I can solve for that, and if I need to find a partner to solve this consumer need and I can make money at it, even better. But I don't start with, I'm limited to this production plant. I start with, the world's my oyster. Not, not what most companies do. All right, questions. We've got some microphones here and here. And you can ask me anything about innovation, um, R&D, my experience at K-State, um, the Stanford Design Program, an innovation program. Most of us here are global campus people. And can you tell us a little bit about your experience as an online student? Did you feel connected? Did you feel like you were able to, you know, like you were part of the K-State family? I, I felt like um, when I started down this journey, I knew I needed to get my undergraduate because um, I, I had my two-year college degree and I had my first patent when I was still an hourly employee. And I had PhDs going, how did he do that? And so the only thing limited, limiting me was the education. That was what would get me to a scientist level where I could really shine. And I was limited by geographic mobility. So I live in Antarctica, or Minnesota. Um, it was a two hour trip to Iowa State University where there's a food science school. And it was damn near the same amount of time to go to Minneapolis to U of M where there's a food science school. I couldn't afford to quit my job and do that. And then the winter time is brutal. Like you'd pretty much have to move there. I had the option at a local community college to get a business degree online through Southwest State and Riverland, but I didn't really want a business degree. I wanted food science because that's what I was passionate about. So I started looking and K-State was out there and I noticed that K-State had, had been doing this since the 70s. And I'm like, well, these guys, that's probably the place to go. And um, I looked into it. I got approval from my employer who had educational assistance. And even they were like, is this real? Is this accredited? Like, how does that work? <laughs> And this is back um, early 2000s when it was still kind of, I don't know, taboo to have online education. Now it's like, hell, everybody does it. Um, but what I liked about it is I had the same teachers and the same content as um, on-campus students. And so I had a lot of colleagues in the R&D facility who were like, did you have Dr. Hunt's class? What did you think of, of Dr. Rett's last le lecture? Did, did she talk about this yet? Did Hunter, Hunter tell the story of this? What about Dr. Phoebus? Did he share that with you? And then they'd start quizzing me. Do you know what ecchymosis is? You know, things like that. And so I had the same kind of experience, but I was distanced, and I had the opportunity to see how the evolution of the program. So it started with getting big boxes of VHS tapes and cassette tapes, <laughs> and waiting two weeks to get my um, test back. From, I'd send it in, my proctor would send it in the mail, and I'm like, I hope I pass. Two weeks later, oh, B, yes. Towards the end, I was taking tests online at the library. Um, I was getting instantaneous grades back. I mean, it's was, it was amazing how much it evolved since then. And I actually came down to campus to graduate. So I actually went, went through and graduated with, with uh, on-campus students. And I really felt part of the team because um, Hunter was there. And Hunter took me through and introduced me to all these young people. Like, this is Nate. He's an online student. He took the same program as you. And I remember the little things like the cowbells ringing at the graduation ceremony. I didn't expect that. Um, so I did feel part of it. And I think now with the new technology and the more, even more interaction, um, back in the day, they did a lot of phone calls where the students would be on and Hunter would call on you and stuff. But now with the, you know, Skype and all this other stuff, it's so much more advanced. And I haven't taken a K-State class since 2008, but I'm sure the program's amazing now with all the technology advancements. So I did, I did feel like a home. And, and coming down here really kind of sealed it. And uh, now I'm really, I'm, I'm really proud that I came online and took the classes because I wouldn't be able to do what I did here and learn what I have and realize my potential if I didn't have that opportunity. Good question. I come from the IT side and software design and um, uh, you talked a little bit about how you prototype, and you, off, you said you mentioned that you sometimes 
put things out like 80% done or whatever to start to mm -hmm. feedback at that level. We do a similar thing where we call it the MVP, the minimum viable product, yes. right? That, I'm sure you're familiar. And so we try to get those out and let people use them and build off of that. Do you find that the, in, in, in not software, but like you said, more physical product design, that, that you're able to deliver things that, that solicit feedback? Because often we have a hard time getting the kind of feedback we want because we didn't think hard enough about what questions we were going to ask around this. So, so what I want to know is how, how you, when you're doing something that's more of an MVP than the finished product, how do you design the interactions with the users that let you get the right kind of feedback? So we have a consumer insights team, and their job is to connect research and the consumer and determine the best tactic to achieve the business results we're looking for. So like we want to know how well does this product perform? Is it up to the flavor? Are we missing any varieties, those type of things. So we, we do a lot of testing, a lot of consumer testing, and there's tons of different ways to do it. And you could probably do that, with, talk about radical collaboration. K-State has a ton of consumer insights focus um, and just pick some of their brains. How would, I, how would I test that? If my product is this software and I'm looking to get X, how would you do that? So ours is a little easier. It's like easier to visualize, right? Because it's food. But um, I'm working on some products right now where we got them to about 70% of the way, and then we showed them to a major customer and got feedback. And then, we, and then now we're engineering them some more to get them to where we want to go. Then we'll get more feedback. And then we'll still get to market pretty quickly, but we'll have refined and got customer input along the way. So that's definitely a way to do it. And what happens to most big CPG companies is they get stuck in this. They're so risk averse. If you knew the stories of like, folks like Justin Gold and these people that start these companies and they like they don't have pennies to their name like when they're going to Expo West they're spending their entire entire budget for their company just to put a booth up so they look legit right so they have a passion they're following the passion they might not even be making money at the time they might have leveraged their house over this so but in corporate America we tend to be super risk averse and so most companies overstudy overanalyze take way too long and what happens when you do that in innovation is if you wait too long, then your competition gets in there. And that's the most frustrating thing ever. When you thought of an idea like three years ago, and for whatever reason, you're still thinking it through, at some point, you got to take a risk. And you can always tweak it as you go. So even if you launch it, you want to make sure it's like 80 90% of the way there. But you can tweak it, change it, shift it. And most people are afraid. They think they have to like package it up like it's finished. And it's going to sit on a shelf for like 30 years. And that's the way it's going to be. Um, the, the best products are the ones where you tweak as you go and you learn. Spam's a great example of that. Most people are like, spam? But think about spam, it's still relevant today. It's, um, we sell more spam today than we did after Y2K, when everybody was starting, you know, stockpiling the, for the end of the world. I think there's like 14 different varieties. It's sold all over the world. It's super popular. It's in gift, gift baskets. Like if you go to Korea and stuff and you buy a new car, you get a gift basket of spam. I mean, it's pretty amazing. But that brand's been able to stay relevant and, and have an emotional connection to its consumer because back in the day, it helped in World War II. It, that's why it's popular in Hawaii. Like that's the meat that kept our family going. And my grandma served it and I serve it, you know? So remaining relevant with your consumer. And, and in your case, um, and the same thing happened with RIT, they're like, well, I don't know about, should we even ask them that? I don't want, I don't want them to think we're not doing this. I'm like, you don't want them to think that you're not proactive, that you're not working against these things. So you want to be proactive, like even if you're not perfect, at least people will give you credit for, hey, at least they're trying. Yes, I have two questions. One, can you share with us a little bit about your, your experience in the training at Stanford and design thinking? And two, what can you share with us some tips um, keeping, you know, keep being innovative, creative every day after, like you said, oh, there's so many failures to get to that point. So how do you motivate yourself to keep going, keep being innovative and creative in your daily work? Okay. So the Stanford experience was, was pretty crazy. Um, they send you out to California to the Stanford campus. Um, it's way different than a normal, like, course. It's like in a really cool building and everybody's kind of zany and there's, you know, whiteboards everywhere and things to play with and things like that. And they start explaining this process to you, but they immerse you right away. Like they're like, 
here's your project. The JetBlue executives are going to be here on Thursday, and you're going to present ways to make the SFO airport more approachable for their consumers and other consumers, because airports are notorious for bad behavior. And then they just like, so here's the first lesson on empathy. And then took us to the airport and dropped us in the terminal and like go interview people. And it was like, that for me was really hard because it's like, these are strangers. Like, I don't know what they're gonna say. They might tell me that screw off. But most people are really nice if you approach them and tell them why you're there. Um, and you learn a lot, so we learned a lot. And fast forward to like that Thursday, our teams learned the processes of innovation. We, we prototyped, we brainstormed. And some of the ideas that came out of it that we presented to JetBlue were, one was a good behavior pay it forward program for Jet, JetBlue employees. So if you're a um, JetBlue pilot or JetBlue, um, I forget all the titles in airlines, but and you see someone do good behavior, like step out of the way for an older woman or help someone with a bag, as an employee, you can give a pay it forward ticket that has a ticket for them and a ticket for them to pay forward. And it's things you can get, um, you know, a snack on the plane or a, an extra beverage or things like that, just little things that make things better, but you're also taking your extra ticket and you're paying for good behavior. So that was one where it's like, how do you encourage good behavior? Another one was called social seating. There's two types of people on planes, the ones that leave me alone, I wanna work, I wanna listen, watch a movie. And then there's certain destinations where jet blue flies where people wanna know from the person next to them, like, so have you been here before? Where should I go? Like, what's cool? And so we come up with this um, idea for social seating where part of the plane has seats that can turn so you can have a conversation so you're not like this the whole time. And um, stuff like that. So we presented to them the ideas and they were very receptive. And then finally, the experience that stands out in my mind and I talked to um, uh, Dean Karen uh, at uh, dinner last night that scared me was the last day was like a Friday and we're just like getting ready to go home kind of thing. And they said, Two weeks ago, we put out a call that there's gonna be a class on design thinking here today. And guess what, you're the teachers. And we were like freaking out. They said there's like 300 people upstairs from the community and we want you to partner up with, with another person and you're gonna teach the design thinking principles to like eight people. So talk about a way to learn quickly, throw you into the fire. So that was really powerful, but I think about it now, it's like I can teach this stuff and I'm not scared or intimidated because like even when I was a rookie, like when I just learned it, they made me a teacher. So pretty powerful stuff. And then the second question was about how do you stay creative? Um, you gotta have a balance. There's studies that prove that the more you relax, like you always say the best ideas come to you in the shower or on vacation. My best ideas come to me on vacation. I think the company should just pay me to go on vacation all the time, <laughs> um, but they're not buying that. Um, but I, I get a lot, of, I make sure I have downtime. Um, and I also, uh, I also like to have hobbies. So it sounds weird, but I've learned a lot from raising chickens. Like I never had raised farm animals before and I started raising chickens and I learned about like their behavior. I read like five books. And you know, that's gonna, there's different things where I've learned things that I'm like, it's kind of like that. I'm like, what about this? And they seem way different, but I can apply those. So it's, it makes you think differently or like reprograms your brain. So I try to have really diverse hobbies that get me thinking differently about, you know, what if I applied this, this idea to food, you know? So it's all about always remaining curious and like your hobbies can do that for you. Um, I'm huge into wildlife management. So I started with being a, a deer hunter. And now um, this fall, I'm gonna graduate from um, the QDMA and get my wildlife certification to where I'm a, I can actually like manage land and actually increase deer herds and I know biology, I know agriculture. So I'm like a nut when it comes to hobbies, I wanna learn everything. And through so that process I learned biology, I learned agronomy, I, now I have a tractor, I do fields and stuff. I mean, it's all alien to me, but I learned all this stuff I taught myself and, and learned from the best and then it changes my thinking. It's hard to explain, but it, I can apply that to my job because I think differently, because it changed the way I think. So you always got to give yourself stimulus, like something new. That was a great presentation, Nate. Uh, if you look at Hormel, a $10 billion company, right? 
how many innovation managers or people in the, in the innovation group uh, would exist across all, all of your companies? And how do these people such as you stay so current with this crazy expanding technology that we have in the food industry? I mean, we're delivering pizzas with drones. We're curing cancer with various ingredients. How do you keep yourself current when it's uh, changing so fast? So we have a lot of resources, so we have a lot of partner um, research companies like Mintel and other things that come in and present to us. Like, there was a presentation on um, leveraging cannabis in food, and like, like five years ago, that's like taboo, and now that's a real, a real world thing for food processors to think about. Like, what's the role of cannabis? Like, Coke's looking at cannabis right now. Not that we're going to do that. I'm just throwing that out there. So we get a lot of exposure from different areas. We also attend uh, conferences and go to like the Expo West. We're seeing like startup trends like CBD oils and the plant protein proliferation. And there's a lot of opportunities in a company like ours through a lot of different research venues. Um, and then everybody's kind of got to be a foodie in a way too. Like when you go on a business trip, like you want to see the Am Amazon Go store in Chicago. So you might set up some time to go see that. So you just keep that curiosity going. And then everybody in our team, um, we've got a corporate innovation team and then we've got broader um, subsidiary teams. Um, we're always bouncing ideas off each other and then we have an innovation share out where we're sharing what we're working on and what we're thinking about and then talk about the power of being on a beach somewhere. Um, my manager asked me four years ago, how do, I, how do we bring all the innovation managers together and teach best practices and share and create this sense of camaraderie when some people live in California and some people live in you know, the East Coast and we're right here? And I had this idea for the Fuel of 15 Innovation Summit where it's a three-day summit and we bring in entrepreneurial speakers, we do training, we have experiences like where you go into the city and actually live the trends. And so we do that once a year and we bring in all those managers so they can have some downtime so they get out of their, their bubble, if you will, like everybody has a bubble and try new things and experience new things and have conversations and that changes the way they think and it's been a really powerful tool for us as well. Um, I'd say my favorite book is probably Walden by Henry David Thoreau because it's been my favorite because I'm, I'm an outdoorsman. I like the, living in the country. Like I find solace just in simple things in life. I have a kind of job where I work for a Fortune 500 company. I go all over the place. I've been behind some big ideas, but in my personal life, I like to sit on my porch and watch my chickens and, you know, cook some burgers on the grill. So I'm just a regular person. So what I like about Walden is he pulled back the complexity of life and made things simpler. And I think that's so important in today's day and age with all the social media and all the everything news coming at you that we're overwhelmed. And sometimes that's a really great point with innovation. Sometimes you can have too much information. Sometimes it pays to be, assume a beginner's mindset and just come into something with no clue and, th and then think about it. You know what I mean? Like when you were asking me about education at K-State and, and I was throwing out ideas that she probably hadn't thought of, but I was applying, I was thinking the way I think about my job and like how could food be the answer for increasing enrollment and starting new program, programs at K-State. So um, it's just about having a beginner's mindset. Like even though technically I might be an expert in some things, I never feel like an expert. I always feel like I don't know enough. And that's probably a good thing is that quest for constant learning. I listen to a lot of podcasts too. Um, Joe Rogan. <laughs> yep. You can learn a lot from stuff like that. He'll have doctors come in and talk about new diets and you know, we're all pressed for time so you gotta manage you know, where you put your resources. Okay, are there any last questions in the room? Well, from all of us, we'd like thank to you. say a big thank you to you. So it was a fantastic presentation, and I just want to remind everyone we have refreshments outside, so please uh, 
Uh, Nathan will be here if you have questions for him or you want to follow up on something. Uh, but enjoy the refreshments and have a fantastic afternoon. Thank you for coming.